In 2010, I bought 200 square yards of land in Rajasthan, India for $1,339. Currently, that land costs $6,697 after almost 12 years. However, if I had invested in Bitcoin instead of that land in 2010, can you even imagine what that $1,339 would have been worth today? $1.3 billion! The big question now is why the government is against cryptocurrency if people can become millionaires by investing in Bitcoin? Why not understand the science behind Bitcoin with the help of 3D animation? Besides learning how people make money from it, why not learn how the cryptocurrency world works? This video is sponsored by Master 3D with Professor. We'll talk about this best rated 3D animation course later in this video. The first thing you need to understand is that money equals value. If I buy a car, I will pay some amount to the company. I will pay the cash in return for a valuable thing, a car. As a result, I will get from point A to point B faster and more comfortably. In short, we give money to anyone in the world only if and when we get some value in return. But about 8,000 years ago, there was no such thing as money. So in ancient times, if A person had extra 5 bananas and B person had extra 5 apples, then person A would give 5 bananas to person B, and in return for his value, person B would give 5 apples to person A. In this case, there is a transaction of commodities in place of money, and this system is called the barter system. But the barter system had a significant drawback. Suppose person A had a cat, and person B has a donkey for the transaction of commodities. Then person A will accept the donkey in return for a cat, as a donkey helps carry luggage. But what is person B supposed to do with a cat? Make pickles? The barter system failed miserably in such cases because it facilitated the exchange of value but could not facilitate fair and equal trade. For something to be considered valuable, people must believe that it will continue to remain valuable for a long time to come. That's what led people to leave the barter system and start trading in precious metals like gold and silver. In this new system, if someone wants a donkey to carry luggage, he can buy a donkey for 10 gold coins, and if someone wants a cat, he can buy a cat for 2 gold coins. Fair trade started as soon as people began trading in gold standards. Eventually, gold mining and circulation started getting rigged, and carrying gold was also comparatively tricky. Hence, the government suggested that you deposit your gold with the government, and it will issue you a receipt in return. That receipt will be acceptable for trade across the country. It will be easy to carry and not rigged. After some time, the government realized that more currency would need to be printed as the population increased, but gold in the country was extremely scarce. Therefore, the government ended the gold standard, and the people now have to trust the government and the currency will circulate in the market based on the government's promise. This is the reason why you, me, and every currency note circulated in India is signed by the RBI governor with a message that I promise to pay rupees XYZ to the holder. In a nutshell, I've been given this currency note by the RBI governor on his responsibility and assurance, and if I offer it as payment for any valuable thing in India, the other person will have to accept it. But with technological evolution, people ditched physical currency and started adopting digital currency. People began paying with the mobile phone itself via Paytm and Google Pay. To fully understand cryptocurrency, you must know what happens when you make an online payment. Suppose I went shopping and liked these shoes at some X person's store. Now, since person X is giving me the value in the form of these shoes, I will have to pay him some money in exchange for the value. Let's say $53. Now I will open Google Pay on my smartphone, scan its QR code, enter secret credentials, and then there will be a processing gap of about 1-2 to two seconds before the final payment is done. You will notice that payment processing by partner bank is written here, but the question arises what the exact meaning of this line is. Understand that as soon as I tried to give $53 to person X, a processing request was sent to my bank. Further, the bank will check whether I have $53 in my account to pay or not. If the appropriate balance is available, the transaction will be successful. The bank will update its ledger that $53 have been debited from my account and $53 are credited to X person's account. This ledger is nothing more than just a sheet stored in the central computer of the bank in which the transaction data of the bank's customers is noted. 
This is the most significant difference between physical currency and digital currency. If you have a currency note, you can touch it, smell it, even use it for cleaning, etc. However, when you make digital payments, you realize that money is nothing more than just an entry in the ledger. When I transferred $53 to Person X using Google Pay, I fully trusted the authority maintaining this ledger to only debit $53 from my account and not a higher amount. Similarly, Person X also has full faith that it will credit $53 to his account and not less than that. But trust is not enough to prevent these banks from committing fraud. The RBI acts as a central bank to supervise these banks, and the Ministry of Finance, Government of India, controls the RBI. As a whole, our current financial system is essentially centralized, which means that we have given 100% control of our money to the central authorities. This has resulted in granting so much power to these central authorities that they banned rupees 500 and 1,000 currency notes at the drop of a hat. If they wish, they can create inflation in the market by printing unlimited currency, and they can waste our money on fugitives like Nirav Modi and Vijay Malia. The mismanagement of these central authorities has resulted in a situation where the ordinary person can no longer rely on these banks to get his hard-earned money when he needs it. In 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper to save the general public from the ill effects of centralization. The title of that paper was Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Satoshi Nakamoto did not reveal his identity. He may be an individual computer programmer or a group of programmers. Satoshi Nakamoto explains how we can eliminate central authorities by using cryptocurrency and decentralizing the financial system to get direct control over our money. For those who are still confused about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, I must tell you that there are over 10,000 cryptocurrencies in circulation in the market right now. But in this video, we will only talk about the science of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the world's most famous and oldest cryptocurrency, others being Ethereum, Dogecoin, Binance, Tether, and the list continues. To understand the working mechanism of Bitcoin, we will get back to the shoe example. While publishing this video, the value of Bitcoin is more than $53,580, but let us assume that the value of a Bitcoin is equal to the shoes, that is, $53, as it was in the year 2013. To further understand, Person X sold me shoes, and in return, I transferred a Bitcoin from my mobile to his mobile. This transaction for shoes will have to be noted in some ledger. In the enthusiasm to decentralize our financial system, we have removed the central authority, i.e. this bank. But still, the big question is who will maintain the ledger of these transactions now? Am I right? If you remember, I mentioned moments ago that Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper on Bitcoin in 2008. If I show you the title of that paper, it says, Peer-to-Peer -peer Electronic Cash System. Peer-to-peer -peer means that now, no central authority will maintain the ledger. Instead, every person transacting Bitcoin, who is part of the Bitcoin network, will maintain this ledger. Let's suppose, apart from me and Person X, five more people are there, namely A, B, C, D, and E. These people are also part of the Bitcoin network, so the ledger in which Keyshore paid one Bitcoin to Person X is written. Everyone would receive a copy of this ledger. So in short, we can say that as long as the bank maintained this ledger, it was only available in the central computer of the bank, and it was a private ledger. But now that everyone has a copy of this ledger, it has become a public ledger. Further, the next time I buy a TV from Person X for $530, I will note the transaction in my ledge that Keyshore paid 10 bitcoins to X. Similarly, Person X will also verify and record in his ledger that Keyshore paid 10 bitcoins to X. And subsequently, these A, B, C, D, E people will also verify and note in their respective ledgers that Keyshore paid 10 bitcoins to X. But if you give it all a thought, several problems will arise. The first problem is verifying and making an entry in the ledger. In the first place, the question is, how will Person X and the other five people know that I have one Bitcoin to buy shoes and 10 Bitcoins to buy a TV or not? 
The second problem is, what is the guarantee that these ABCDE people, who are part of the Bitcoin network, will make a correct entry in their respective ledgers? The third and most significant problem is who will stop person X from tampering with the ledger? For example, if person X wishes, he will enter the ledger that Keyshore will pay 100 Bitcoins to X. Similarly, person C will also write in his copy of the ledger that Keyshore will pay 200 Bitcoins to X. In short, when the financial system was centralized, it was running on trust even then. We were trusting this bank would maintain our ledger accurately. And even after decentralizing, we're now trusting people that these people will maintain our ledger accuracy. But Satoshi Nakamoto had a completely different purpose. To avoid the blind trust system, Satoshi Nakamoto gave the idea of a trustless decentralized financial system and introduced the practical use of blockchain technology to execute this idea. Please note that the word blockchain is crucial in this video. Blockchain technology is exceptionally revolutionary, and in the next 10 to 20 years, blockchain technology will change the whole world. To understand how blockchain technology is used in Bitcoin transactions, let us once again look at the example of shoes. I bought the shoes from person X, and in return, I will transfer one Bitcoin to him. I will note this transaction in my ledger, and this time, instead of distributing the ledger openly, I will store it in an online block. This block used in blockchain technology is made up of a total of three sections. The transaction data, in other words, the ledger, is stored in the first section. Hash is stored in the second section. Hash is nothing but a type of fingerprint. Just like every person has a unique fingerprint, similarly, every block has a unique fingerprint called a hash. A hash is automatically generated when the ledger or data is added to the block. The previous block's hash is stored in the third section, which we will discuss later. I gave one Bitcoin to person X in exchange for the shoes, and I saved the ledger in my block by entering this transaction in the ledger. But what is the guarantee that I had one Bitcoin to give person X in the exchange for shoes? Maybe I don't. So there's only one way to find out. To know the total balance, I need to check all the Bitcoin transactions in the past, or instead, I need to check all the blocks. You can clearly see that a chain of blocks is being formed. This is why blockchain technology is used in Bitcoin. In a similar case, when this block has to be validated, that is, to be checked, these Bitcoin miners come in handy. As gold is in a limited amount, it has to be mined to find it from the earth. Similarly, Bitcoins are also in limited amounts, and to generate them, it has to be mined. According to the working mechanism of Bitcoin, there is only one way to validate this block of my shoes transaction, solving some extremely complex mathematical puzzles. An important point to note here is, these miners do not manually solve the puzzles themselves, but use their compelling computers to solve the puzzles. If so much computing power is used, then the electricity bill will be very high, and the value of the machine will also decrease over time. So in exchange for validating blocks, some Bitcoins are given as a reward to these Bitcoin miners. As soon as miners validate my block, I can now distribute this block to the whole Bitcoin network. Please note, along with us, these Bitcoin miners will also possess a copy of this ledger. That is because they are also part of the Bitcoin network. Further in the future, if I buy a TV from person X, I will give 10 Bitcoins, and I will note this transaction data in a new ledger, and I will store it in a new block. The miners will then validate this block and will receive some Bitcoins for validating the block. Lastly, after validation, I will forward this block to everyone again, and all those who are part of the Bitcoin network will add it to their respective chain. Similarly, if D sends four Bitcoins to E, then D will note this transaction data in a new ledger, will store it in a new block, and then the miners will validate that block. In the end, we will all accept that block, add it to our chain, and this cycle will go on. One major problem is solved, but another problem is that these block owners can edit the block at any time and make changes in its ledger in the first section. For example, suppose person C is a hacker and is part of the Bitcoin network, he can easily open the block and make changes in the ledger. What if he changes the TV block and enters Keyshore will pay 200 Bitcoins to C? In short, he is tampering with the block. 
Similarly, if everyone starts fiddling with the blocks for their benefit, the whole Bitcoin network would become useless. But the good news is that it is not possible to tamper with the block because of the hashing properties. If you remember, I told you that a block is made up of a total of three sections. The first section will store the transaction data. In the second section, the hash of this block will be stored, which is automatically generated and is unique for each block. Finally, the third section will store the previous block's hash. Hashing property means that the hash value in the second section depends on the first section and the third section itself. Therefore, if someone tries to tamper with the block, the hash will change completely. The good part about this system is that it is impossible to predict the new hash after making changes because of the cryptography techniques. The cryptography technique is used to maintain privacy and security in the digital currency, Bitcoin, and hence it is also called cryptocurrency. Now, as soon as person C changed the data in the TV block and wrote that Keyshore would pay 200 Bitcoins to C, the hash changed accordingly. Now, since the third section of the next block of this chain had the hash of the block that contains a TV, thus the hash of this block has also changed. Similarly, the third section of the next block contained the hash of the previous block. If that changed, then the hash of this block changed. In short, in the blockchain of this C person, all the blocks after the block containing this shoe became invalid. Its entire chain became invalid. But how will the Bitcoin system know that a C person's chain is wrong and everyone else's chain is correct? So listen, Bitcoin will choose to go with the majority in such a case, where the majority of blockchains are similar. But since only this C person's blockchain is different, so the Bitcoin network will ignore this C person's blockchain and will consider it tampered. So all the transactions with the remaining nodes will remain except person C. Before explaining why the government wants to ban cryptocurrency, please understand that you should only invest that money in Bitcoin, which you are ready to lose. I say this because the Bitcoin market is precarious and volatile, but the market of the 3D industry is neither risky nor volatile. Therefore, investing some money in your 3D skills can ensure a secure career. The clarity with which I explain the concept of Bitcoin to you, I have launched a training program to teach you 3D animations with the same clarity. That premium training program named Master 3D with Professor will launch on the 1st of July 2022. The good news is there will be a flat 70% early birds discount for the first 1,000 students who are eager to learn 3D animations. Make sure you visit brainrig.com and subscribe to my authentic newsletter to get weekly updates on the course. If you remember, I told you that the first goal of cryptocurrency is to decentralize the financial system. In other words, to remove the central authorities like banks, RBI, and the government that controls our financial system. This is the first and the foremost reason the government is against cryptocurrency. The second and more important reason is that no one regulates crypto. If there is no one to watch the money transaction, anyone can send Bitcoin to terrorist camps. Anyone can pay for drugs in Bitcoin. And even after doing so, many illegal activities, the accused will not be caught because of the privacy of the Bitcoin transactions. This is the most crucial reason why the government wants to ban cryptocurrency. Thank you for watching. And yes, if you want a dedicated 3D animated video on blockchain technology and Bitcoin mining, definitely tell me in the comments section.